You can listen to the Backward Compatible Podcast anytime, anywhere, in any way you like. Subscribe and listen to us on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Then, join the discussion. It's the developer's intention to kill you. This week on Backward Compatible, the crew is joined again by Will Parsons and Dr. Adam Bracken to discuss Middle Earth, Shadow of Mordor, and the questions it raises about emerging gamer subcultures. Plus, turning underutilized game concepts into RPGs. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. <laughs> Backward Compatible. All right, Backward Compatible listeners, uh, this is Richard. I don't know if you recognize my voice. It's been so long and so sparing, <laughs> but this is uh, Podcast 13. We're back with our good friends Adam and Will. Uh, here to talk more about uh, RPGs and related topics, and so uh, I think Jim has our icebreaker for the week. Uh, yes, I do, Richard, and we're, we're also joined by uh, uh, Chris as well. Hi, I'm Chris. Uh, so we no, 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 Chris is here. No. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm never here. I'm, I'm only on all of the podcasts. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, we do have our full uh, uh, back and compatible crew here, along with our guests today. Um, for the icebreaker, um, since we're we're getting ready to play a, uh, another role playing session of uh, Star Wars: um, Edge of the Empire slash Age of Rebellion, um, I was hoping that we could uh, come up with sort of our own role playing game, tabletop role playing game, kind of like brainstorm some ideas, sort of to give people an idea about what the um, sort of generation, the design work behind an RPG might be. Um, but for fun, I'd like to sort of throw out there uh, if we come up with a very um, abstract or unconventional or just like plain weird concept for an RPG that maybe hasn't been done or if it has it's been done poorly <laughs> uh, that we could we could sort of address and try to figure out a way that we could craft it into an RPG. So pretty much just delve into Chris's design portfolio. <laughs> <laughs> I see <Ouch>. you. <laughs> nice. Harsh. But yes. <laughs> I'm pretty sure every idea under the sun has been done badly at some point in an RPG. That's, that's true, and I think I think the the fun part is not necessarily that we're going to come up with something that's totally new or unique, or even if it's necessarily going to be playable. It's just more about having fun, brainstorming an idea, and kind of get the ball rolling, and then see where it ends up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, one that comes to mind, I guess, is time travel. Um, there's a Doctor Who... That was mine! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry to steal from you, the Doc. You stole it. You know, I have to go into the past and be the first to jump in. <laughs> I'm the Doctor. I'm only allowed to make these comments. Okay, so actually, Chris already we'll, did that. We'll, we'll pass it to Doc, then that can be his <laughs> idea. <laughs> Darn, now I've got to think of something. <laughs> no, I've got to think of something. That's the trick. Um... I mean, we're not cutting any of okay, well, this is all staying how, in. How do you define time travel? Because this, this, I've actually been on about this for, for years. I <laughs> challenged my students for years in the role-playing class to come up with a decent time travel role-playing game. And, and to my, in my opinion, uh, no one ever succeeded completely. Right. Um, but I always started with the come see me mm-hmm. sort of asterisk on that one so that after class they would have to come in and my question to them would be what's your theory of time travel? What's your definition of time travel? Right. And that has to be fundamental to the mechanic. Mm-hmm. So I challenge you with the same question. What is your theory of time travel? Because we could all create time travel role playing games and they could be completely different. Mm-hmm. And I mean there is um, I'm sure there are plenty of them out there um, Doctor Who being a big example based on licensed product. Yep. Licensed um, but I think Doctor Who kind of um, benefits from the idea that you can kind of like make whatever you want to happen happen just like kind of explained it away Doctor Who pretty plays pretty fast and loose with the rules exactly yeah Yeah. so if we're making a role playing game out of it we probably want to have something that's systematic and something that is as you said Doc um, uh you know the the theory of time travel has to be fundamental to the way you play the game Mm -hmm. um for example could you go back in time and uh kill Stephen Moffat at birth and actually fix Doctor Who. <laughs> As an example. Very specific. There's one of these awkward silences. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, all, we're all wondering if uh, you've, you've been thinking about this before, and if so, how much? 
<laughs> well, um, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, betray my secrets because I, I don't have the flux capacitor at complete um, power levels yet. But uh, we, we don't want him getting stopped before he can carry out his plan. Yeah, I'm just waiting till next year. Whenever they invent the Mister Fusion, we'll be fine. <laughs> it, it's either that or make a deal with Libyans, and I'm not comfortable with that. <laughs> it's been a while since I've done any um, like reading or watching or anything like that related to time travel, so I'm trying to. Recall okay. some of the stuff that I've looked at in the past. Well, so if we're talking about just what is your theory of time travel, I suppose you have to come down to the fundamental questions of can you change time? Mm. Does time flow in a line, or is it a branching path? Yeah. You know, so what are, what are there, is your answer to that? Are there multiple dimensions? Is it one thing? Right. Are we yeah. talking about an Eisenstein Rosencrantz bridge, or mm. what? What is your theory of time? Mm-hmm. It's a point. This is this one's hard to describe because you have to use temporal terms to describe it, and you can't because they don't fit. Um, time is not linear, it all happens simultaneously, so time is simultaneous. Uh, the best example is a loaf of bread. Our perception is each individual slice, but the whole loaf is there at all times. Hmm. So in the case of uh, taking out Moffat and saving Doctor Who, you can't because your reason to do that would still be present, because which means you, want to fix you Doctor can't Who. go back because you've already made those choices. You've already done those things. Hmm. So the only way to change things in the past and make the past a better place is to go back knowing nothing about that set of past's future, which also on Doctor Who is what I like about the radio dramas, because the only time he changes stuff is when he purposely goes somewhere without knowing what's going on there. So what you're saying is that what what has happened will happen. It, it's unchangeable. This is the Bill and Ted. I think, I think you're saying it's based on your yeah. knowledge and perception. If you personally yeah. know what will happen, mm-hmm. you can't change anything. That's why the radio dramas are great. Was when he goes back, he starts changing things. As soon as he recognizes where he is, he's trapped in what will happen. So he goes in blind. Fair enough. Hmm. So so basically, that's kind of the um, you can't create a paradox theory. Like, there is no way to have a time paradox. Right, the universe won't let you. Pretty much. As opposed I, to there's no fate but what you make, which is the... Um, so then, taking t- Terminator. Taking that into consideration, that's actually a really interesting premise for a time travel game, because players want to travel in time you know, in a game to accomplish a specific goal. But if they travel back in time wanting to undo something, you know, which is going to be your typical goal, you know... If you can't directly accomplish that, then what mechanically would you say the players can do? Well, exactly. for example, and if then, you don't actually, if you don't, if you don't follow sports that closely, then you could go back in time and you could buy a sports almanac, <laughs> and you could still use that to make lots of money on sports betting in the future. That's actually what I was going to suggest mechanically <laughs> is, uh, you know, the presence of like items or artificial wealth. So, you know, as a player, if I was going to, you know, munchkin or circumvent the rules, maybe I can't prevent the villain from being spawned, you know, by going back in time. But I could go back in time and, you know, tell a certain character or a certain set of people where, uh, you know, a a natural vein of diamonds might be or something like that, Mm -hmm. you know. And then when I return to my character in the future... My character is now exorbitantly wealthy, you know, or something like that. And I, and then I have the, the resources to take on this great evil. Or, you know, I can alter There's... tertiary events in the past that will give me an advantage in the future. So I would sort of mechanically design this time travel uh, system to be more of a modifier than a direct story element, I suppose. Hmm. See, I did the I did the exact opposite. Oh yeah. Um, I made mine a direct story element in that each of the episodes that they played in was a separate. Uh, they went to a separate location and didn't realize that time travel would be involved because they started noticing connections between rifts opening. And in the last episode, they were told what they were trying to prevent, which was a major temporal catastrophe. At which point, they went back in time to each specific place they'd been before they had arrived, set things up for their arrival, and gathered tools to prevent the catastrophe. And in so doing, and this is where it became a a story element, when they came back, they caused it. Preserving their timeline, because they now had the reason to go back and do all of that, but they also had the tools to solve it after it was started. Huh. Interesting. So essentially, we have sort of two mechanically contrasting ways to you know have a, a time rpg is you either use time as an ancillary mechanic to player interaction 
or you use time as a storytelling tool and essentially make it into sort of like a puzzle. Yeah. yeah? Sort of the micro well, versus the macro level? Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, that makes sense. I was going to say that the other, the other option, which I don't think it's appealing because it's almost kind of breaking the rule of having a time travel RPG, is to literally just have the time travel aspect be used as like scenery or a backdrop. Mm-hmm. But I think that's one that's not even really worth um, exploring yeah. because then you're really just placing uh, the characters into a particular time period and you're just kind of using that as your starting point. Yeah, and it, right. it's been done to death too. Yeah, for sure. Right, right. Um, I suppose on a related note, the, the RPG that I've li- I would like to see that I haven't seen actually, it, like this is something that you know I've never even seen executed, let alone poorly, is uh, the concept of heirs and like lineages. You know, a lot of times, naturally, when playing an RPG, you know, say you play Dungeon Dragon, Dungeons and Dragons with the same group for 20 years, and you know, you get together with your friends and you run uh, Tomb of Horrors campaign, and you bring in your paladin that didn't die all those years ago, and so you have a recurring character that you know existed in previous sessions. <laughs> Adam's cat is walking across the table and kind of just slapped Chris in the face with her tail. She's going to rub against the nice. microphone in a second here yeah. and play for it. But so, um, essentially, Don't cut it. essentially the concept, you know, has been used before that you would bring in characters that have existed or if your character dies, you roll up a character that is, you know, the son of your previous character. But sort of like a mechanically... Uh, inclined uh, character creation system wherein the benefits of a previous character or the accomplishments of that character can be passed on to future characters and in such a way that you're encouraged to say run one shots with certain characters so that in a single group you know spanning five or six nights you can essentially play out a lineage of heroes you pretty much just described King Arthur Pendragon. King Arthur Pendragon? Oh, yeah. Is really? that a system? Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Oh, because I was going to say it sounded, it sort of got me thinking about um, the whole Fire Emblem system of, of the genealogy. That's, that's kind of what I was thinking and, about, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. then you could have the whole, the whole issue of um, uh, potentially like setting up two, two characters um, that, you're, you know, that are also players mm-hmm. um, right. in a particular one shot for the sole purpose, like they each specifically go after certain skills for like the sole breeding, purpose of having yeah. children. Exactly. For the sole purpose of like, hey, let's just do this so that the next RPG we can have like children that have both of these skills and be like so is, super powerful. Is King Arthur Pendragon, is that a, a pretty good system? Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm I clearly just, a good designer. <laughs> I, I just started playing it recently. I haven't played a ton of it. Um, have we, either of you guys played it before? No. Um, uh, we, we just got started with the campaign, and so far all that we're into is just sort of setting up, um, establishing what our family history was and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But you play as knights in um, Arthurian Britain, and uh, you actually have, like, you know, a backstory. Like, you know, like, who your grandfather was, who your great-grandfather was, what they did. And you inherit some of their glory. Like, part of the, like one of the big objectives of the game is to um, amass glory okay. by doing these big heroic feats and stuff like that. Um and you also uh, have things called like passions, which are um, like, for example, hatred of the Saxons is a passion, and that can affect things mechanically, especially um, as you're um, exploring story elements. Saxons. Yeah, exactly. Um, but then what happens is uh, you play as this one character, and typically you have like one adventure per year in their okay. life. Um, like one session equals one adventure per year, except um, for winter. Except for winter. Winter is kind of calculated out, kind of at the end of each session. Um, Nobody travels during winter. But then uh, when your current character dies, if you've had sons, then your son is the, your next character. Okay. Um, and you actually like have a coat of arms that you pass down. Um, you inherit certain traits, certain passions, stuff like that. Interesting. Yeah. Well, See, it can yeah. also be like a nephew or a chosen heir, mm-hmm. as well as a daughter who marries. So I'm the only yes, person exactly. at this table who has not heard of this game. <laughs> I no, I haven't heard of it. I haven't up. heard of it either. Oh, okay. So Jim, okay. But you're not at this table. You know, you, that's true. That's true. That's true. <laughs> uh, I'm there in spirit. But so you mentioned like the sort of seasonal thing. That's something that I have seen used to great effect in a lot of systems, especially. Um, um, uh, what's the loot crane system? Mouse guard. Mouse guard. Yeah, yeah. mouse guard uses the uh, the seasonal idea really well, mm. and I've seen that played out quite a few times. A lot of these things are to do with t- 
time and lineages and mm-hmm. things like that. That's a really interesting design concept that hasn't really hit the mainstream yet. Like I haven't heard of this system, and mm. you know the concept of time travel doesn't really hit the big ones like D and D, Burning Wheel, mm-hmm. things like mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. So you that's could something. argue that it hits GURPS, but GURPS is GURPS. Yeah, but GURPS is GURPS. Yeah. So. Well, here's a fun <laughs> connection for you. The guy who's running us through that system, mm-hmm. uh, Nathaniel, is actually one of the co-creators of the Doctor Who RPG. Well, there you go. So <laughs> yeah, clearly, we need to you know get him uh, as as a guest and mm-hmm. man he he will he will rock the world of backwards compatible all right will do you have an idea that is not related to time oh um no i mean it can be related to time just <laughs> i got one oh, sure go for it yeah um well i've been playing a lot of uh, uh shadow of mordor right yes which yes. has that new um, nemesis system mm. You Which know what? So, spur of the moment interruption, I think I want to talk about that and related issues for our meaty discussion. You got you it. as mine? Sure. Absolutely. Um, sure. Actually, I, I haven't played much of Shadow of Mordor or, or any at all, so could you explain what yeah. the system is? Yeah, well, um, the, in, in short, the Nemesis system basically is designed to, and we can d- debate whether it's successful or not, but it's designed to make the enemies personal. They level up when you fail, mm-hmm. and... Uh, because of the the narrative of the game you're caught between death and life and so it makes sense that when you get killed you come back Mm. but um as a wraith which is kind of funny because it's the lord of the rings uh but but the neat thing about it is that these things these guys will come back and you run into them again in the world and they'll be like i thought i killed you once Mm. and and, and they'll mock you and all these other things and they're stronger and and whatnot and so it's really kind of cool you you can find yourself uh avoiding them Mm. When you discover where they are, you, you get intel, you discover where they are, and, mm. and you go, oh, that guy's a little too powerful. I'm going to stay away from him until I level up a little more or something like that. That's the way it's designed to work. The problem is it can be very samey. Mm. Um, so what I was thinking of today is that what if instead of being in a single-player uh, adventure game, it was in an MMO setting? So that it solves that age-old problem that, um, we'll just pick on World of Warcraft for a minute, had whenever I would go and uh, kill the Troll King Mm -hmm. with uh, a random buddy online, and then he would have two heads, because that was the quest item, was to get his head. (laughs) I think I told this story last time. Um, I'm not sure if you did on the podcast, but I've definitely heard it before. Um, But, you know, it, it kind of ruined the immersion. But what if instead we had this nemesis system in place in an MMO where my nemesis was a character on the online game and I needed to go get people to help me to kill him because he hated me. There's a couple of designs that sort of touch on that that have like barely started to scratch the surface but they're really excellent. So the first one is in in regards to multiplayer Watch Dogs. Mm -hmm. Overall, I very much disliked that game. I thought it was kind of a failure. But its multiplayer aspect... You had uh, other players that were linked in through the online system were other hackers that you could encounter in real space, Mm -hmm. and you would essentially have to catch them and, like, counter-hack them, and it would communicate to the other person, you know, if they messed you up. And then you could encounter that person person later on, and you sort of have this uh, emergent nemesis factor in these other players. Mm Mm-hmm. Another interesting thing in the MMO space, Final Fantasy XIV, one of the world bosses was Odin, you know, sort of like the legendary Final Fantasy sure, character, yeah. right? Yeah. And um, whenever you killed Odin, the world boss, you had a certain amount of time to do so. Uh, it was very challenging as you started to kill him more and more and he would reappear. But what was interesting is the person who dealt the killing blow the last time, Odin would take on their appearance the huh. next time he appeared. So when he would spawn in the world, uh, the zone that he was in would kind of get, like get snowy and like sprites would start to appear and the zone would change. So you would know that Odin was around somewhere and you would find him and he would be atop his horse like usual, but he would be he would look like the person who last killed him. Hmm. So it takes like a raid of 50 to 100 people to down him because he gets stronger every single time Mm. but the last person to kill him now is Odin that's sort of the concept and that actually relates back to Norse mythology as well Mm -hmm. and so that was a really interesting system especially since you had guilds competing for the Odin kills and so sometimes you'd have like the main tanks of certain guilds would be Odin (laughs) and it would sort of have this really cool social aspect to it and so that's something that like has sort of scratched that surface but I can already tell you that that would be phenomenal. I would love it if that was like a mm-hmm. further explored mm-hmm. system in MMOs. 
Well, I, I'd like to throw out there um, creative verse and talk oh, yeah. about creative verse a little bit. Um, one of the things that, that I do is the Lab Ventures channel mm-hmm. and on, on YouTube. And we had a chance to get an early look at Creativeverse and in the alpha and, and that sort of thing. Playful set us up with some codes, and that was a lot of fun. So, but uh, one of the things they were trying to do was to make it an MMO, uh, intentionally designing it for an MMO space. And the idea behind it was that crafting, similar to Minecraft, would be something that was very personal. Because there were time limits in, on things, uh, you, you would literally, in real time, in, uh, in real ways, be a problem for you to learn all of the crafting because it was a tech tree. And so you sort of had to mold, or you had to class. It had a class system, essentially, that would be emergent within the context of, of what you were doing. And so what they were trying to do was make it so that I would need to get my buddies to craft swords because I wasn't in doing the, you know, the, the swords and stuff. I was over here doing uh, building stuff and having sort of an uh, economy emerge and that kind of thing. They were expecting all this really wonderful emergent play to, to come out of that MMO space. And for role play, uh, R-O-L-E play, yeah. to come out of that system. And it turns out it, it's been a complete failure in that regard. Wow. They have now announced that they're going to do away with the timers. They're uh, still keeping what they call Mojo, which is an in-game currency, but... Uh, that you pay for with real money, of course. Sure. Yeah. Uh, but they're going to do it for <laughs> cosmetic stuff, for no, you know, novelty vanity stuff, all of that. And sort of get rid of the play to win aspect. That's or exactly. Pay to win yeah, aspect. That, and and that wasn't their intent. They never wanted to do pay to win. Uh, they wanted it to be in in such a way that uh, it was mechanically impossible to to do everything. In the same way that in World of Warcraft, it's mechanically impossible to do everything. Um, but you can sit around and you can become an expert fisherman if you want to. You just need to spend a couple hundred hours doing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what they wanted to come out of this. And instead, people pushed back against it so hard. And I, don't, I, I don't know the answer of why that is. Mm-hmm. But I'm fascinated to know why. So my real question in this is, can we design an MMO that has such a, a loosely defined emergent properties to it that... Um, the society can build itself within it and, and that sort of a thing? Or do we, need, do we need those rigid structure systems of, I am a warrior, I am a, uh, a rogue, I am, you know what I'm saying? I, I think... By classing. I think um, Eve and Arc Age kind of do that already, actually. Um, kind of Good these, examples. These, these sort of faction-based, I mean, it's not necessarily on a personal level quite as much, although I'm sure people have their roles within their guilds and corporations and stuff like that. Um, but it's very player driven, very emergence in the way that um, people are going to be competing for resources. Um, people are going to have their things that they're really good at, that they contribute to their faction, mm-hmm. that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, we talked about um, this last time Richard was on with us about um, Arc Age and how, like, you know, you're, you guys are going pirate with mm-hmm. your guild. Um, and there's there's a lot of different sort of uh, emergent um, opportunities for players to do stuff like that. Now, is Arc Age uh, one server? Or is it multi-server? It's multi-server, yeah. Uh, but the servers have very high population. So, for example... That's good. Not, the that's not surprising. The US and EU uh, servers, there are, I think, 10 of them. And the total population has now broken 2 million. Wow. So, uh, but so, okay. you know... Is it the WoW killer? No, no, certainly not. No. It's not It's not an MMO for everybody, okay. you know. But for those who are interested in that kind of MMO, it's definitely the next Eve. Cool. Yeah. Um, What's really interesting, uh, you know, relating to because this is all about the sort of the nemesis system concept. Yeah. Uh, Arc Age uh, very much embodies that concept. Uh, now that I think about it, because the game essentially features player-driven difficulty is how I coined it last time, and um, because to accomplish things similar to Eve, you know, you have to ferry goods around physical in real space. You know, you have to. In a medieval setting, you carry a trade pack on your back and you hike it across the continent and then you jump on your boat and then you sail your boat across the ocean. And at any point during all of this, you could be attacked by another player. You know, either your own faction, you know, betrays you and kills you to steal it or you encounter pirates on the open oceans and things like that. And you sort of uh, have players and more accurately, guild tags. Uh, they gain their own nemesis, sort of, you know. So my guild is actually the largest pirate guild in North America, actually, and um, we are kind of known as like 
the the scourge of the seas, you know, as the pirate faction. And so it's gotten to the point where now if people set foot on the open ocean, you know, they make contact with us first to try and barter their way through. Or if they're going to be going on a big trade run, you know, they hire out other guilds to, you know, um, protect certain you know, oceanic travel routes to make sure that we can't, you know, pirate these people's merchant ships and things like that. So the game space has allowed us as players to become mechanical nemeses to other players. That's fantastic. So uh, I definitely think that game mechanics and uh, sort of creatively scripted encounters, similar to Shadows of Mordor, but Mm -hmm. on a more sophisticated level, would definitely be a great complement to that, though. I think that'll be where we hit the real sweet spot, where this nice mixture of players and mechanics come together to create this sort of persistent enemy system. That's what I'm hoping they're doing for Star Citizen. Yeah, I agree. And that's kind of what it looks like they're doing for Star Citizen. Mm -hmm. I'd like to think so. Which, yeah. So. All right, so we have Jim and Will, who have yet to throw out a game idea. Scientific exploration. Okay. You do not find that in RPGs hardly at all. Um, The Atomic Robo RPG, which is pretty new, has an entire class based on action scientists from their comic book. Um, But it's, it's treated as a skill. So there's, there's no benefit to using any kind of scientific exploration, any kind of cartography or mapping in any RPG that I have seen that is not just a one-shot, we need this right now. Hmm. There's nothing that drives okay. any so kind there, of there's game no, around that. There's no science no. for the sake of science. There's no science. Necessity is the mother of an invention idea? Kind of, yeah. Okay. But hmm. maybe more of an RPG where even... I mean, when they make a Star Trek RPG... What's what's what do they do in it? You build your away team. You make sure you've got the right equipment, and then you fight off Klingons or something like that. <laughs> Which is, if you watch the show, not the not point even Star remotely Trek. the point. Yeah, but it's it's what engages people, etc. So I have I've played a lot of them. I've never seen even a Star Trek game that focuses on exploration. The closest you get Which is, is like, of course the whole point of Star Trek. <laughs> the closest you right. get is the old interplay point and click adventures. Yeah. But okay, that's a really great idea. You know, um, I also have yet to encounter a game that is like very mechanically inclined towards the sciences, or you know, for example, cartography and things like that are skills that you see in a huge number of games. But it's always, hey, my character is lost. Let me. Does anybody happen to have the cartography skill to roll to see mm-hmm. if you're not lost? Yeah, yeah. You know, instead of like you know, having a sort of compendium of maps and secret locations and shortcuts that your character can sort of, like, progressively work towards. You kind of see, um, and this is not really an RPG, but you do see, for example, in uh, Pirates, um, Sid Meier's Pirates, Mm -hmm. there's a big focus on exploration, cartography, and um, yeah, you know, trying to like map map out the space and, and if we're not talking where you are and where the best parts are. And, yeah, if we're um, not talking about like standalone RPG or uh, I'm just sorry, um, pen and paper tabletop RPGs. Have you guys ever played Miasmata? I'm not uh, even sure I can um, spell it. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I've I've actually I I read a lot about it and I but I had never actually got the chance to play it. Yeah, same here. Would you like to talk about it because I I was always always been interested in it. Sound like yeah, I mean like I'll briefly concept. mention why it's so interesting. You know, the concept of the game is that you're this uh, disease infected individual who's like banished to an island where you know medieval people send diseased people. You know, and uh, there you have this twofold you know mission. One is to cure yourself. You have to find the cure and invent the cure using like all sorts of plants and medicinal herbs all over this island. And the other goal is to map this island. You're within the first few minutes of the game, you are given a compass and a map and everything and essentially you have to like find points of re- reference to triangulate your position and after you set up this little experiment, you can map out different parts of the game region. And so you actually do periodically and manually map out the game Uh, and then you know once you have mapped out these areas and you've noted in your little scientific journal where certain plants are you can then go back to these places harvest these plants and create medicines 
that start to work towards you curing yourself. Mm. And that's kind of the whole point of the game, with these other tertiary mechanics mm-hmm. involved that sort of spice up the experience, you know? Cool. Do you guys remember a game called uh, The Incredible Machine? No. Yes. Okay. Yes, I do. The cool thing about The Incredible Machine, and this is this is old, it was like 90s four-ish, something like that. Um, uh, You know, and then there were a couple sequels. But the thing about it was you were supposed to create this um, very complex machine using things like monkeys and rubber bands. (laughs) um, So Rube Goldberg. Rube Goldberg machine. Yeah, 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 I remember seeing this when I was little. And and basically you're supposed to get the ball to go through the hoop or something. Um, And there were all these crazy ways you could do this, but one of the fun things about it was there wasn't one set way you could do it. You could you could kind of given the tools that you had uh, find ways that were never intended lots of emergent stuff and and this is my buzzword when it comes to new RPG ideas how can we make something emergent so yeah it wasn't expected from the beginning because to me that's the that's the holy grail that's the Thing that's kind of the thing that people promote as the whole point to play a tabletop RPG yeah, right. especially in the day of computer RPGs it's um, you know what we can do what GMs used to do DMs used to do of like having a very set linear story that the players are going to go through maybe with a few twists I mean we have that in computer campaigns mm-hmm. now we don't need that um, in tabletop so tabletop is letting us do what we can't do with computers so I'm, I'm really looking forward to um, Fortnite when it comes out, mm-hmm. um, no, I'm, a, I'm a big Minecraft guy, mm-hmm. but uh, Fortnite is not cubes, it's walls and it's plans and it's things like that. And so, you know, I can build my wall out of cardboard, I can build my wall out of cinder block, I can do all these other things depending on the plans that I have and I've found. And they are also promising that the microtransactions are going to be purely um, cosmetic. Right. Uh, hopefully. And it's a free to play game, so, you know. Uh, but what I'm looking forward to with that is, oh, you have a plan I don't have? Come over here to my base and, and build this for me or teach me how to make it. I mean, we don't even know how it's going to work yet. But right. that, to me, sounds like um, the right way to do it. Hmm. I don't know yet. Yeah. But if, if, I can, if I can enter into a world pop, entirely populated by heroes and still feel like I'm awesome because I'm unique then I, I think that will be successful. And not just because you're the one of the shiniest loot. Right. right. Or, or yeah. the silly hat. Yeah. Or Odin looks like me. Right. Exactly. <laughs> uh, like which is very, very, like sounds very, very cool. but Right, but like very mechanically relevant things. Right, exactly. Um, so, I don't know, maybe there's a, a game space where you could throw down a trampoline and have a basketball and actually make some kind of Rube Goldberg machine in, in a 3D <laughs> MMO environment. Um, I don't know how that would work or what it would be for, but that would just be awesome. Yeah. All right, Jim, how about you? What is your crazy RPG idea? Um, well, I don't know if this has been done before, but um, I, I sort of thought of this as we were talking about different ideas, and it, I think, ties in a little bit to what Will was saying about um, you know, science and exploration and uh, what you, Richard, were saying with Arc Age and the um, uh, traveling trade goods to and from locations. Mm-hmm. And I think it'd be interesting to do um, a tabletop RPG with sort of like a, a basis on a mercantile system um, you just trade, made this big trade, smile like, pop up on Will's face. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking like you know like um, like Silk Road that sort of thing where you have to figure out um, you know you're you're not you're not a um, hero you're not necessarily even an adventurer you're a merchant you're a trader and you're trying to um, get your goods from one location to another you're trying to get the best deal you're trying to, to barter for other goods so that you can make you know, your particular. Um, shop or business or what have you more successful yeah that's something that you know the vast majority of games focus on combat you know it's very rare that you find a game where the combat section of the rule book and the weapons and equipment sections aren't you know dwarfingly larger several, than, several chapters worth of just like here's yeah, all the weapons yeah, yeah. and that's yeah. something that I know Will here has really tried to do in a campaign that we've been running for about two years now but haven't been able to get back to you recently uh, you know, he's like the merchant of the group and that's all he does I have basically oh, no really? other skills in it um, at this point I finance everything that we do and part of that, the, the rule system doesn't really emphasize that Yeah. so you have to get like as a GM, Richard has to do a lot of stuff. He actually had to revise their their money system because I'd already broken it. <laughs> <laughs> he broke it hard. <laughs> yeah. In in the like third session, I founded a brand new bank for a continent. <laughs> nice. Oh, so, nice. Yeah. But yeah, that's definitely 
you know, the sort of resource management thing is something that a lot of players really like to do, and very few games, both physical and digital, uh, encourage. Mm. Well, it's and you, kind of considered its own genre, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I suppose yeah. so. It's just really hard to find. Like, I've been spending the past few months looking for a new um, single single person space trader game. Mm. Uh, something like Gazillionaire. I don't know if you've any of you've heard about it. Nope. Gazillionaire yeah, is basically I, a spreadsheet. It. It's um, a game that most of what you do is look for buy and sell stuff, pick up cargo, take it to the next spot, and deal with things on the way. Mm-hmm. But there's no combat to it. Mm-hmm. There are random events that you make choices on. But it's about making more money and building up your ship bigger. It sounds a little bit like Freelancer, but Freelancer is yeah. slightly more combat. Or focused. kind of like yeah. the the space or futurism victory conditions in Civilization. Yes. Yeah. The difference being in this one, you have one ship. I can find plenty of stuff where you build a galactic trading empire with countless ships, etc. But finding one ship where you are building up your ship, making more money, and progressing on. The last thing I have is from the 90s. Because it just doesn't... Hmm. They're not made as often. Hmm. You know, Transport Tycoon has been heavily modded and, and released with various builds um, in multiplayer now. I had, I did, was not aware of that. Mm-hmm. I've used to play Transport Tycoon a lot, but again, it's one... You have multiple things. Rather than running one truck, you have multiple sure. trucks and trains. Rather sure. than What I would love is a single plane that you're, uh, you're piloting, say, out in Australia... And you're having to make shipments, choose where you're going next, avoid weather, make sure you buy the right stuff. When you get there, prices dropped out before you got there. And having to make up for that. Interesting. But finding one of those is really difficult. Yeah. All right. Uh, So I think now is probably a pretty good time to switch over to our main discussion, which um, it sounds like now it's going to be about um, Shadow of Mordor. So, Richard, what was it that you wanted to talk about? Well, so specifically... I've been wanting to talk about sort of a dual issue. I want to talk about the concept of flow in games, flow theory, you know, Chexic Mihai for those who aren't familiar. Sure, sure. And then also in a related topic, I want to talk about how people perceive the quality of games. Um, okay. You know, well, b- before we get started with um, the overview of that, would you like to take us through uh, flow theory for those that are not aware? Sure. I okay. might be listening. So. The concept of flow is a theory in psychology that essentially states that there is this perfect resting point between challenge and reward in which you are completely engaged. So for some people, flow can be achieved through, you know, underwater basket weaving. It's just like the coolest thing ever. You really enjoy yourself. It's not so easy that you get bored. It's not so hard that you get dauntingly frustrated. And when you complete a project, it's you know, fulfilling. Mm-hmm. Uh, some people do sports. Uh, for those who are really engaged by sports and enjoy playing them, winning a game is, you know, excellent and it's awesome. Losing a game is just frustrating enough that you want to play again and win. And it's not too frustrating that it's like, ah, oh, I, I hate this and I never want to do it again. Yeah, yeah. Flow and- is this sort of middle ground where there are enough positive and negative feedback loops that keep you engaged and also keep your eye on the problem. And there's also there's also one thing I wanted to add to that too, and I know it's a word that you don't necessarily like, but it's being used in a different way here from a psychology standpoint, um, and that is immersion. Right. Uh, because flow doesn't just apply to games; it applies to pretty could theoretically apply to just about anything that you do in life. Right. Exactly. And part of getting into into flow is getting into that state of immersion into what you're doing, to where everything else around you just kind of drops away. And you just sort of you're able to um, have this this level of, of focus that yeah. um, is much greater than you would normally have because everything is uh, you're so engaged in, in it. And say. that's particularly relevant to uh, flow in games because otherwise, you know, uh, football or underwater basket weaving these are just normal activities. Whereas in games, you know, if you're engaging in this particular media. Uh, you're going to have a certain suspension of disbelief. So, whereas normally it wouldn't matter if you're killing orcs in you know at the Black Gate, you know, now you are. So, if the game does something, you're talking str- about the difference between like the physical having that connection to like an emotional connection to something that you you're no no I'm talking about to get that through physical means. Is no, I'm right? talking about how like you say normal. I want to I want to define normal. Right. And not so just leave when, I, when I said that, I'm I'm more referring to something that is. 
nonfiction versus something that's fiction. The narrative you know? context. Right. So, for okay. example, if I am achieving a state of flow in doing a crossword puzzle, that is distinctly different from my achieving a state of flow in playing a character in an RPG. You know, both of them apply to the same psychological principle, but they're achieved in two drastically different ways. Mm -hmm. um, so, with regards to Shadows of Mordor, you would achieve flow by fighting orcs, doing really well, but not doing so well that it's just ridiculously easy, you know? Uh, and this is sort of what has gotten me onto this topic of discussion. Uh, this has been one of the more hyped games of the past couple of weeks, and when it released, you saw reviews from every big gaming magazine, and nobody mm -hmm. could stop talking about it. And, um, you know, I'm not one to pay attention to things like Metacritic and number-based reviews and things like that. You're more of a Kotaku man? Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> man, I just can't get enough. Um, but, you know, so the game has been getting pretty consistent, you know, 95s and mm -hmm. things like that. And Well, you know, that's, again, take that as you will. I don't really pay attention to things like that. But everybody pretty much universally agrees that it's a fantastic game. And Except Destructoid. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'm looking at the reviews right now. That's why I say that. Right. Well, what's funny about it too is you know the reviews have all been really positive, but I've also been seeing a lot of things like on Facebook and stuff because we all have a lot of game designers in our circle. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people have actually been like, at least as far as I can tell, kind of down on it in a lot of ways. And this is sort of what I want to get onto is a lot of the people sort of downvoting it, I guess, are almost all universally for the same reason. Uh, Doc, you mentioned earlier that the game gets kind of samey, and I totally agree, and that's definitely points against it. But I watched this video that was like this sort of video review on YouTube that people were passing around, and there was another review, I think it might have been Destructoid's review or some other game review company, and they were essentially harping on and on about how easy the combat is, that it's not Dark Souls enough for them. <laughs> You know, and that uh, if, you, you know, if you expect Dark Souls, nothing is going to satisfy yeah, personally, you. Personally, <laughs> I think it fixes the problem I always had with Dark Souls. Exactly, which is, death isn't frustrating. And so, with with this game, people, you know, if you're a, a fairly prolific gamer and you're really good and you play Shadows of Mordor, it can be you know easy for you. It's not like cripplingly difficult, you know. Um, and a lot of people are, have been. Are there, are there difficulty levels? No, the there is no difficulty setting. Um, oh. And so what people... But have it adjusts to your ability. Sort of. Sort of. It's the it's not a very drastic swing. Mm. Some of um, us are so good. <laughs> at least not that I've noticed. I've I don't know the mechanical relevance of that. All I know is that the vast majority of people seem to encounter the same level of gameplay. Uh, but the point is that people have responded very, very harshly against a lot of people saying how good the combat system is and how fun the combat is. Because that's pretty much the entire game is just combat. That's right. You know? Yeah. That's like all the game is supposed to be. It's just fighting monsters. And it is fun. And it's so fun. But a lot of people have sort of rebelled against this. I don't know if it's just because they want to be, you know, against popular opinion or what. But um, I saw this video that circulated quite a bit about how simple the combat system is. And this guy makes this big deal about like, you know, he holds his mouse up to his webcam and just clicks the left mouse button and he successfully takes out a group of orcs and <laughs> then he like turns off his monitor and continues clicking the mouse and mashing his keyboard and he can still fight off orcs and things like that you know and he makes this big deal about how you know well i'm such a good gamer that i find this game to be ridiculously easy and so it sucks you know and that's like that's the conclusion is that the combat system isn't as hard as dark souls or it, it doesn't require the same timing as arkham asylum so the game sucks. I want to know how many hours he put in to get his character to the level where he could do that. Sure. I've reached a point where I can hit the triangle and circle button simultaneously in pretty much any fight, any standard fight, right. and, and just win. Yeah. I can even do it um, at about an orc every 10 seconds. And, you know, I got to a point in the game where you fight one of the first kind of like mini bosses. It's one of, uh, like, the Hammer of Sauron, I think, is the character's name. And, you know, I got him to, like, 5% health and then just started toying with him to see what it would be like. Mm -hmm. And I got into this loop where he, like, roars and swings his hammer at you and you just click the right mouse button and your character kind of, like, flicks his hammer away. <laughs> and I did that a 100 times in a row because the boss would, like, as soon as he recovered from your counterattack, he would just do it again, and then again, and then again. <laughs> and so, 
you know, at a certain level, yes, the combat system is simplistic. And I think what people are missing is that the combat doesn't have to be Dark Souls. You know, Dark Souls has been this kind of cultural craze lately. Mm. People just like they were super hyped about Dark Souls 2 after the first one got popular and the concept of dying a million times while you're playing a game is just really enthusing to a lot of people. But, you know... And I, and I think, and just to kind of just kind of cut in and say something about that concept, too, because I've been playing a game that that's the focus right now um, in that game as well, uh, Volgar the Viking, which is a 2D game, um, but it also has that focus of just die a million times. And I think there's, there's kind of a difference between um, the concept of making a game very hard, but still like beatable on your first try if you're if you plan things out and are you know progress uh, carefully versus something like dark souls where i can tell you right now from playing the game that there are some hazards that you come across that you literally cannot be prepared for. right it's the developer's intention to kill you in dark souls. exactly and exactly. that's a certain genre of game i would assert that dark souls is not a well-designed game i think it's just culturally we think that it's awesome and fun. It's a very you know? shiny version of I Want to Be the Guy. Right, exactly. I um, actually agree completely. Yeah, and so um, with Shadows of Mordor, for example, people have rebelled against its simplistic combat system. You know, a series of left and right clicks with the intermittent, you know, a couple of buttons on the keyboard. And I want to, you know, say that people don't really understand you know the concept of flow in games mm. people think that because something is easy and you're able to beat it on your first try it's inherently a bad combat system or it's cheapened or something mm -hmm. and this reviewer in particular he went on this big rant about how the game does this really great job of making you look and feel like you're this badass Gondorian ranger and you're flipping over ten orcs and, you know, you get this 100 hit streak without being touched and, you know, uh, you can counterattack two enemies at the same time by countering one and then the wraith appears and counters the second one. And, and you know, he goes on and on about this and he's trying to say that the combat is too easy and that the game is, you know, too simple. But in describing that, he was describing how cool you looked and how fun it was yeah. and how your character is this badass and it, it empowers you. In, in a way, I think that's a slight sort of like backlash to the idea of hardcore versus casual. Mm -hmm. It's like, this is clearly a mainstream game. It's like, it's very hipster, you know? It's, right. This is a mainstream game that's just trying to sell out of copies and appeal to people, make them feel cool. And us real gamers are the ones who like challenges and like dying and all that sort of stuff. And it's like, you know, if you have fun with the game, who cares? Right. It's a um, fan film. Yeah. It really is. I mean, it, it is the lost world to Jurassic Park uh, of Lord of the Rings fiction. <laughs> it, it just is. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you, you mentioned, too, me. um, the idea of a Sorry. flow. It's, it's dead. The, the idea of a flow. You know, there are some games that have actually been designed around that, where they try to adjust the difficulty to your skill level as you go along. Mm -hmm. um, namely, flow and, you know, flower, to an extent. You know, those games that have flow in the name. Ten of a chin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And company. they they um and they borrow a few ideas from that in a uh, uh, spore actually you mm -hmm. know like that first level is very similar to flow. Um, he consulted on that actually. Oh, well, that yeah. makes sense. <laughs> um, but the idea is that like as you get better and as uh, you gain more skill, things start getting harder. But then if it starts to be overwhelming, then you'll sort of regress a little bit. Right, and that's level. the concept of the difficulty curve in designing a game. You know, as your players become more skilled in playing your game and get more used to the game you amp up the difficulty to keep that level of flow you know because if you don't increase the difficulty your players are going to get bored if you spike the difficulty up way too high early on your players are just going to be frustrated and they're not going to have fun the goal is that middle ground and that's you know that's design 101 when it comes to games and i think that our sort of cultural addiction to things like Dark Souls and uh, VVVVV, the game where you die like a hundred yeah. times in the first level, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and Super Meat Boy and these, I want to be the guy. These like masochistic games. I think the genre is actually massa game or yeah, something. Massacore. Yeah, massa we, we talked about massa a couple weeks ago. Yeah. I've heard that term before. Really, yeah. That's yeah. Interesting. And, and okay. so I think yeah. our cultural addiction to this genre has kind of colored us against fun games. 
Yeah. And I think that's kind of a bold statement to make yeah. that it has like kind of made us anti fun and you know you pro know hardcore. But so I would honestly I was, make that claim. I was gonna say I, I think I think actually what's going on is it's kind of a backlash as games have gotten more mainstream. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's a way for people that um, you know have been playing games for a long time to say, hey, I can play this game. It's super super hard, and no one else wants like a lot of people that especially quote casual gamers don't want to play it because it's so hard but i can play it and i can get really far and that's because i'm a real gamer yeah that's what i was saying i I think it's i think it's just this backlash from games going from um a niche entertainment to a more mainstream entertainment i'd certainly agree and i think that this sort of multifaceted issue is kind of causing both a uh a damper in the quality of games we receive and you know in a linked issue it's causing issue in games journalism you know and causing issue in how we receive and consume games and the fact that shadows of mordor is a game that you know adam you mentioned earlier is just kind of like a fan film and it's pure intention is just to be fun Mm -hmm. when i booted up the game you know i only had like a couple hours to play before a class and i was having a blast just like chopping through orcs left and right and you know oh man i flipped over this guy that was so awesome Mm -hmm. and like the executions and the combat strokes they're, they're so like well done and the um animation linking is so masterfully done the animation system in that game is phenomenal and it's supposed to just be this like feast for the eyes and this like you know, self-indulgent flow experience. And because it's not Dark Souls, a lot of reviewers have really (laughs) rebelled against it. It's like, I think it might be just sufficient to acknowledge that it's not Dark Souls and then judge it on its own merits. You know, it's not trying to be Dark Souls, so why do we have to judge it against Dark Souls? You know, Mm -hmm. to me, I mean, you know, there's the obvious parallel of it's a fantasy RPG sort of thing, and it's both action games, you wield a sword primarily or whatever. Um, but, you know, in a way, you can start to get to the point where you start to compare, like, you know, racing games to sports games or, you know, shooters to role-playing games. They're totally different things, you know? And, you know, I think uh, an interesting comparison to draw is that this sort of good design, you know, Shadows of Mordor is, while it's certainly a AAA game in the sense that it's got a lot of production value and it was very, very advertised... It's, you know, definitely no Assassin's Creed, and it's definitely no GTA, you know? So, I mean, while it would fit most people's definition of AAA, I would honestly say that its design philosophies are pretty indie. Like, Mm. its intentions are just to be this contained combat experience, and we don't really see that in AAA games anymore. We don't see the kind of refined vision that Shadows of Mordor has. Mm -hmm. Every game nowadays has to have 40 to 50 hours of content Mm -hmm. and all these different things you can do. And, and a mix of all these different genres and yeah, concepts. Be, right, well. exactly. Be, be everything to everyone. And, you know, yeah. about you know two months ago or whatever, when we played Strider, you know, the concept of Strider, this little indie game, is just to be like this super fast ninja flipping around and charging through levels. And mm-hmm. I had the most fun when I was trying to speed run the game, you know, because mm-hmm. it was this very, yeah. like, it had a high skill cap, but it wasn't too hard, and it was just this really awesome flow experience. And I think that's something that this new AAA game has, you know, espoused, and gamer culture uh, is starting to rebel against it. I'm not even sure it's fair to call gamer culture a thing anymore. Um, mm. I think that it's it's got it's too many microcultures in it. Yeah. To to have a consensus. That's fair. That's um, certainly fair. Any more than we could say American it, it, culture or, believes this thing. Or even, you know, if you want to compare it to another media thing, movie culture. You right. Know? Exactly. Like yeah. what what is the movie culture now? It's you like, know, that's an interesting point that we've sort of gotten onto is, you know, do we now have for I don't want to say the first time, but you know, at least transparently very very clear gamer subcultures like we we've always had the you know, the arcade gamer and the mmo gamer mm-hmm. and we've had the hardcores and the casuals but now this is sort of making its way into the triple a space and the um you know the sub defining uh, genres of this i mean this is like basically a carbon copy clone of arkham asylum except it's in you know mordor you know, would anybody dispute that if you, if you guys have played the game? I haven't played it, so I can't say. I haven't, even I haven't seen it. played it, <laughs> but having played the Arkham games and with your description of um, of Shadows of Mordor, um, it sounds like Shadows of Mordor doesn't really have that um, narrative focus that the Arkham games arguably did have, and it also doesn't have the um, 
um, a- added investigation aspect. Actually, we haven't about. talked about the narrative at all. Yeah, uh, but that, there is I, a very strong narrative. There's a very strong. And narrative. And it, I was, um, oh, really? I was actually about to ask um, because another thing I've been seeing is uh, you know you touched on the nemesis system. Yeah, but it seems like there are um, a lot of interesting story systems in there. So there are. Uh, in fact, the missions are, are procedurally generated as well, based mm-hmm. on what's happening within the context of the Nemesis system. Um, now, some people are probably sitting there going, "What? What is the Nemesis system? We never really defined it." So, right. I, I pulled up EG, uh, IGN because they've got a really great definition of this, and so I'm not going to read the whole thing. But it says, uh, "Nemeses, in other words, the the orc captains. That's really what we're talking about here. Are defined by many different factors: their names, their visuals." Uh, are generated randomly. Their power levels, which level up. Over 9,000. Uh, yeah. Uh, their rank, um, meaning that they actually um, go from captain to... War chief. All the way up to war chief, yeah. Um, and then um, they can also be considered a veteran, an elite, or legendary, things like that. And their relationship to each other. And then the fighting style... Yep, what type of weapon. Uh-huh. The the traits that they have and the location. And i got to tell you, the most fun thing for me is to have this guy who just kicked my butt a second ago. I go get some intel, and I realize that, that he has a weakness to headshots. You sneak up behind him where he doesn't see you, you one-shot him. Yep. Um, hmm, nice. That's fun. My first encounter in this game, uh, I actually, uh, I think it was like Bolgar the Mighty was the orc's name. Sure. And he started off with a power of five, and he was this random archer that had poisoned arrows, and I was just doing a quest. Um, uh, sort of a spoiler, I suppose, but Gollum is featured in this game. Yes, he is. And uh, one of the first quests with Gollum, I was fighting a bunch of orcs and doing my own thing, and then suddenly I'm down on the ground and I'm poisoned, and it cuts over to this orc that just attacked me, and he starts monologuing at me. Yeah. And he's like, ah, filthy human, blah, 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 you know, <laughs> and, and I die because, like, I was just suddenly overwhelmed. Like, because these captains and these named orcs can appear at any time, you know, because mm-hmm. they're just roaming around in the world and you can just run into them and there's dozens and dozens of them um that's a really good point that's very important though mm -hmm. is that they don't appear out of nowhere because the system decides randomly to roll a die yeah they were there you just didn't notice them yep you just happened to walk into that area yeah and what's what's so special about this is like i died and the guy ranked up in power and then he was promoted and then i'm going to do another mission and i choose to ignore another mission that's going on to do this one mission and after a certain amount of time, the game lets me know, oh, hey, these two war chiefs and I re- or these two captains and I recognize the guy's name uh, were in a recruiting thing and you didn't go stop them. And so they successfully recruited people and now their power levels are boosted up. Mm-hmm. And then I was doing, you know, so over the course of like the next hour of gameplay, I just kept on stumbling into the same guy. I don't know if I was just getting unlucky or what, but sometimes he would escape and sometimes he would kill me by surprise and I don't know, it was just bad stuff would happen. Uh And by the end of an hour, this guy had ranked up to be like power level 18 and he was uh, a legendary captain and, you know, and so it's like, okay, I'm going to hunt this guy down now. I'm so tired of this guy. And so I, I mark him on my map and I go hunt him down. And at this point, he's gotten so strong that he can one-shot me. Mm. And so I have to like, I have to go hunt down an orc that can give me some intel on him. And I spy on the guy and I see that he's vulnerable to beast attacks. And so I go hunt down a Karagor, one of the mounted creatures. And I go tame it and then I go hunt him down again. And <laughs> it turned into this huge, basically a quest to go hunt down this random NPC that I had formed a nemesis with. Yep, that's pretty awesome. It's phenomenal, and this is just like this tertiary element to the game's narrative, because you're this ranger that's been sort of spited by the orcs, and Mm -hmm. you know you're like out for bloodlust essentially, and it's just phenomenal. The game is a ridiculous amount of fun. I like that you call it a tertiary thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Did did you happen to read um, Isaac Karth's comments on Facebook? This is a a scholar that we went to uh, uh, England with last year. Um, I actually went to a conference there. Um, But but he actually writes about this, and uh, I think he says it really well. So I will quote Isaac Karth uh, by reading him uh, what he says very, very well. He says, I'm all in favor of grabbing the low-hanging fruit. So it's interesting. How can something that is completely revolutionary be low-hanging fruit? Um, 
so the next go round can be higher up the tree, and I think that's really important. Is I'm, I'm less interested. I'm having fun with it, but I'm less interested in playing this game in five years than I am in playing the game that's five years from Absolutely. now that is born from this. Hmm. Right. Okay. Uh, but he uses that secondary tertiary thing. He says, "I'm all in favor of having a deeper systems behind the surface systems. If first tier is the basic verbs and interface, and it was commented on the same string here that there's only really two verbs: fight." and flee, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Which is basically true. Um, the second tier is the combat mechanics, then this is edging into the third tier of mechanical depth, which is usually where the linear progression system goes. Thinking about it, what I'm really looking for is games that have meta verbs, verbs on the third tier that you interact through your actions on the first and second tier. And so for those who are unfamiliar, a common way that we talk about interaction design in games as like those who study games are the concept of player verbs and so those are the actions that you can take regularly in the game so in bioshock your player verbs are going to be shoot reload jump sprint things like that in mordor when we're talking about this in an abstract sense it's essentially fight and run around uh, and so what he's talking about in terms of like the meta verbs is how you would relate to these in-game systems. Like we're talking about this nemesis system here. So a meta verb would be, you know, like, you know, vengeance, you know, or like, you know, gain this sort of vindictive thing against this system. And this is sort of an emergent qual- uh, quality that we mentioned before, this sort of emergent gameplay that comes about when you're talking about these different design aesthetics. And Mordor is a very, very simplistic system. You know, there's a lot of, um, there's a whole field of research that talks about how you apply other research, translational science. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the procedural content that's featured in Shadows of Mordor, this is something that academics came up with a decade ago, probably longer, you know. And so that's what he says when, you know, grabbing the low-hanging fruit. This is a very, very simple concept shadows of mordor yeah uh but what's exciting is the fact that it's actually making its way mm-hmm. into a mainstream yeah, it's, title. it's a simple con uh concept by our standards as people who like study this and try to figure out where the games industry might be going when we actually start to see it happening in a mainstream game you know it is a big deal as mm-hmm. you see and so this yeah. is this sort of uh minor you know as he puts it low-hanging fruit has sort of captured gaming media by storm you know as much as we like to joke about kotaku they wrote like a dozen articles on the game in two days you know people really loved this game uh except for the few outliers who you know just want a dark souls 3 Um, (laughs) (laughs) and so the fact that this design mechanic you know we've been talking about this kind of off and on this whole podcast is the concept of nemeses and emergent gameplay and the sort of meta approach to a game out side of its just its core design mechanics you know that's something that has captivated you know gamers everywhere Mm -hmm. and so the next game that comes out in five years maybe we'll start to see more of a procedural narrative rather than just procedural generation of statistics we can help so yeah we can definitely help the the concept of procedurality is pretty much what things like Minecraft, you know, the generation of Minecraft land and resources are based off of. Uh, We've seen a lot of roguelikes that procedurally generate stats and enemies. And I think Shadows of Mordor is the next step in how we can apply procedural design philosophy to meaningful, to to use the word ludonarrative, experiences. So I think something that a lot of people have been missing about this is the particular relevance of... uh, you know, the various, you know, I said tertiary design elements of Shadows of Mordor. And hopefully in the future, we become more acclimated to things like this so we can sort of shoot higher. Cool. You're here. Mm-hmm. So, is there uh, any closing comments before we start to uh, wrap it up for the day? We basically, uh, no, I, we basically analyzed good. that as time goes on, what we want to explore further is the uh, science of statistics and how it can generate new narratives while we get emergent properties in our games. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, a lot of yeah. the interesting topics that we discussed are like, you know, RPGs dedicated to non-combat fields and different design elements that encourage, you know, unique modes of gameplay and immersion experiences. And I think that's something that, you know, one of our first podcasts, we talked about how that seemed to be the focus of this year's E3 is mm-hmm. new and 
also procedural experiences. Right. And I think we're starting to see that attention yeah. uh, uh, gain some traction in game development. Uh, you know, I ranted a bit about how the, the hardcore gamers seem to be rebelling against a good thing, but, <laughs> you know, uh, progress is progress. Yeah, so. Richard, think of the 11-year-olds. <laughs> what will true. they have to complain about? That's true. <laughs> what will they have to make terrible YouTube videos yeah. about? Well, uh. since we're wrapping up here, I'll, I'll say something that opens up a complete new can of worms, which is that the idea of uh, hardcore and casual is totally blown out of the water. I think oh, that that's sure. completely ruined. Yeah. I mean, come on, my mother literally plays more video game time than I do. Yeah. Because <laughs> you're a doctor of video games. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> but the, the reason why that's true has to do with the types of games that she's playing, what we could define as casual games uh, or, or social games. Um, she, she feels that there is a, a very real world social responsibility to make sure she goes to my farm, which I haven't been on in years, <laughs> and, and water my crops, uh, or, so, or so they'll die. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and the truth is, she, she likes um, jigsaw puzzles, and so she has an app on her iPad for jigsaw puzzles. And, and literally, every free moment, she's playing uh, some kind of a game. So I, I, don't, think that, I don't think that those old labels... Uh, matter anymore and that should be your yeah. topic of, I, of your next yeah i think that would be a yes. great topic think, for next time I, yeah and i think the um you know that there's a lot more distinctions than just trying to boil it down into casual and, and hardcore it's mm-hmm. it's like if you look at the the film space i think is a really great example of all of these different subcultures that that focus around different uh films and different sorts of films right similar to how before we kind of boiled it down to gamer culture and then realized that there isn't really just one gamer culture anymore you right. know mm-hmm. so right. i think i think that would be a really excellent topic of discussion for next time and while we're at it yeah, we can I, uh, I we can define game, game. <laughs> oh god <laughs> <laughs> i think i think at this point we can go ahead and we can say that um uh Similar to the uh, congressional definition of pornography, you know, I can't. Maybe I can't define game, but I know it when I see it. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> and on that note, uh, Leon, let's end <laughs> on that. Note, note, that's good. <laughs> All right, we're exactly. just gonna pick that low hanging fruit and move on. All right, so. this has been the thirteenth podcast of Backward Compatible. Lucky uh, thirteen. We actually had the full trio here this time, and we were joined once again by uh, Dr. Adam Bracken yeah. and Glad not Dr. Will. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Will Parsons, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Peace. We want you to join the discussion on our website, backward-compatible.com. You bring a unique perspective, and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment in our podcast section, and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This time, tell us what you think of current trends in gaming, including the direction of mainstream releases like Shadow of Mordor. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible.